Good afternoon and welcome to the continuation of City Council's budget hearings. Um, this afternoon, the first, we will begin with the Department of Finance. I'll ask our budget director to give an overview and then we'll also turn it over to our directors. The mic's off. That again, excuse me guys. Um, the Finance Department provides fiscal leadership uh, for the city focused on long-term financial health while respecting the interests of its residents. It also carries important responsibility to ensure all entrepreneurs, visionaries, and leaders have the necessary services and city infrastructure to thrive. As the city of Pittsburgh primary uh, revenue generator, the finance department is committed to excellence in financial management for the city, its residents, and businesses. The, uh, Departmental highlights uh, for 2020, the total budget is $173,628,000. That's a decrease of $8.8 .8 million. Total departmental budget, not including debt, pension, and housing uh, fund transfers, uh, is $7,548,000. That's an increase of $2.259 million. Total full-time positions, 42.25, an increase of four-tenths of a position, from 2021. Uh, land care and maintenance coordinator is added. Uh, an assistant real estate supervisor is added. It's split 50-50 with the uh, uh, three taxing bodies. Senior assistant real estate added, split 50-50 again with the three taxing bodies. Uh, an assistant real estate added, uh, also split this time 30-70 with uh, 3TB. Remittance technicians split 1090 with the 3TV. There's also the addition of a supervisor of cashier, oh, that's not the addition, the elimination of a supervisor of cashiers. Um, a remittance specialist is also uh, eliminated. Part time administrative assistance uh, reduced by 1,500 hours or uh, $11,000. Finance subclasses, not including pension benefits, debt changed across nine line items for a total decrease of $51,000 or 1%. The highlights include auditing and accounting decreased by $110,000. Actuary uh, service is not needed and the PCRG contract was reduced. Um, administrative fees decreased by $54,000. Um, the legal fees increased uh, by $50,000. A new contract for Frost, Todd, Brown, and legal assistance uh, was authorized in September. Computer maintenance is increased by $41,000. Contracted uh, increase in CSS Inc. Uh, for tax and revenue management software. Uh, professional services were also increased by $18,000 uh, for the indirect cost allocation from an outside vendor. Department of Finance uh, does not have any capital projects uh, this year, uh, but what it does have is the pension and debt. Um, your total debt cost projected for um, 2022, uh, 60,000 or $60,502,000. Uh, that's up 7% from last year from the 56.4 that we had in debt service. Total uh, pension contribution, um, total pension cost, uh, I'll leave it at that, is $105,577,000. Uh, that's actually down uh, 1%. Uh, with that, we'll go to revenues. Uh, and we had mentioned revenues uh, the first time around, uh, both in my presentation and when OMB was here. Uh, but just to mention once again, total revenue budget is uh, projected to be $657,253,000. And that's an increase of the $48 million uh, from what we had as an amended budget last year. And that $48 million, of course, is the uh, hole that uh, we filled with the ARP funds. Um, and I'm not gonna read off each and every revenue uh, down here, but we know, essentially know the routine. So with that, I'll give it back to you, uh, Finance Chair LaBelle. Thank you. Uh, Director Paulus, is there anything you would like to add? 
Uh, good afternoon, council members. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Bill. Um, I'm joined today uh, by Assistant Director, uh, or yeah, by Assistant Director Jennifer Gula. Um, <clears throat> I'm the Acting Director of the Department of Finance. Um, and in my short time uh, in the capacity, uh, just want to uh, um, shout out to all, all the employees in the department um, that, that are working very hard uh, to process and, and verify all of the revenue uh, that we continue to collect. Um, it's been a very challenging uh, couple of years, um, and we're still dealing with challenging uh, circumstances. Uh, and, you know, we're doing the best that we can uh, to keep up with those collections, uh, posting and, and whatnot. Um, and as well as the forecasting, uh, you know, we're doing it the best that we can um, as we continue to uh, look at, you know, what the next not only year, but five years kind of look like um, in the economy and, and within the city. Um, it seems like every time we uh, have a, a good idea of maybe where we're going, uh, a new variant kind of pops up and, and throws a, a, a curveball at us. So um, just wanted to uh, acknowledge all of the employees uh, for, for their work and dedication. Um, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilman Wilson, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had some questions around um, just as we continue to um, fund and, and uh, get the land bank up and running. Are there any adjusted costs for, you know, um, there's title searches or land care. Is there any adjustment on your end? Um, related to the land bank, uh, not particularly at this time. Uh, we have had uh, title clearing and title searches uh, budgeted within the department for the past couple of years. Uh, we, we try to clear those out uh, so that we can unload those properties in a timely manner. Um, so at this time, uh, we, you know, we we feel that we have a, a good a good grasp on things uh, as we continue to move forward with that land bank. Um, Jen, would you like to add anything to that? Sure. Just to add, um, we did make some changes in three TB where we now offer the ability of taxpayers themselves to secure their own uh, their own title to uh, start the quiet or title search in order to start the quiet title process, which hopefully. Um, cuts that waiting time down on our end. And then we also did add the uh, land care specialist to the 3TB team in order to help assist and coordinate some of the land care efforts that um, our department and the administration has been working on. So mm -hmm. hopefully that answers your question. Okay. How many, how many properties have we Required to have the tangled title that we aren't actively um, going after, and you know, um, trying to move that property ourselves, like hiring outside, an outside business, or I'm sorry, an outside law firm to to get that untangled and move the property. Jen, do you happen to have uh, that number for Councilman Wilson by chance? I do not off the top of my head, no. I don't know how many are currently um, in the various stages of the purchasing process. We could potentially find out though. Okay. This, uh, I'll move on the pension contribution. Is this, uh, uh, is this show reflective of the change we recently made to the pension? No. Uh that 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 isn't reflective of that. <clears throat> um, we received these uh, amounts from our actuary a couple months ago. Uh, while uh, the most recent change with the Social Security offset was uh, still in limbo. Um, plus, we will not see the effect of that until 2023. Um, with the way the actuarial analysis works, we do what what is called a valuation every two years. Uh, and so right now we did a valuation uh, for 1-1-2021. The next valuation period will begin 1-1-2023, which is when those additional costs um, will, will be incurred. You know, it's difficult with this uh, chart here is that pandemic started in 20, 
20. So the year like 2019 would be useful in terms of change because it doesn't really, I mean, 2021 is a difficult year to show a percent change. Um, and and the, within, within the parking authority, being on that board, we made the decision to always show 2019. It'd be interesting. Could you send me the the document with the 2019 column? We have that analysis. Okay. Did do. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the director's uh, page. I did do it in the. In the <laughs> I did do it in our uh, our budget presentation. Okay. Uh, when we started off, but uh, yes, I do have that information. I'll be glad to provide. Yeah. So, what's the what's the biggest? Um, you know, what's the what are the differences here with? Um, oh, the, the the big ones. I don't know yeah. this off the top of my head, but your your big ones are going to be the parking tax, the mm -hmm. preparation tax, uh, and the amusement tax. Those are the big three that took the. We just hit during the pandemic, we actually had an increase uh, in uh, earned income and uh, also deed transfer tax, uh, which helped to balance out the loss. Yeah, but the deed transfer tax, so that's what, so right here it just shows 2%, but it was, if we go from 2019, is it, because whenever the controller was here, he was saying that was. Yes. Like the, and that's, that's what I'm saying. Those, those yeah. are the things, if you go, the difference between 2019. Yeah. And what's that percent from 2019? I forget the, the percentage number on it. It's, it's yeah. So, okay, so it makes sense because payroll would have went up 24% just because people come, come back to... Right, well, the, the problem is, is earned income tax went up because residents that have to pay that live in the city. The payroll prep tax is only on folks that work in the city. Yeah. And they're charged off as they're working in the city. So uh, there's a discrepancy with people working from home and whether those companies uh, should pay with the people working. But it increased. That means that in 2021, a bunch of... 2021 and 2022, because more people came back to work in 20... Yeah, because employment, not because of... Unemployment, not because of the employer switched the... It was because... Where they're working. Physically began to come back to work. Yes. Okay. That's the, uh, that's the hope. But, you know, as uh, Kevin had mentioned... Uh, you know, we keep getting different variants thrown at us. So mm -hmm. hopefully these numbers that we have in there for the projections stand. Look at that amusement tax, 133%. Oh, that's interesting. We are going to events again. Mm -hmm. more so than, uh, what were we at in 2019? Um, in 2019, yeah, amusement tax. Let me see the, on amusement we were at 15.6 uh, 15 .6 million in uh, 2019. Oh, so we're even higher. For 2022 now. Yeah, and, that, and that's due in large part to we, you know, <clears throat> we've seen uh, obviously an uptick in um, you know attendance, uh, like the controller uh, was talking about at his budget hearing uh, a few days ago. You know, if you look at Heinz Field, that's full on Sundays for for games. Um, we've had a large concert over the summertime. Um, we've had uh, additional concerts announced for next year. Um, you know, full seasons for, for all of the sporting events. Uh, and, and so <clears throat> the one thing that we've seen throughout 2021 um, is that amusement tax uh, is kind of on, on pace for where we, where we thought it was going to end up. Uh, we originally estimated it um, at, you know, 7.2 million and, and keep in mind what early in 2021 looked like. Um, so now with, you know, the new, the new football season and, and hockey season and, and concerts and whatnot, uh, we are on what we feel is on pace to, to meet that $7 million amount, uh, but then more importantly, rebound to uh, a 2019 level, uh, a prior pandemic where, you know, more concerts are, are being, are being announced. Um, hopefully the variant doesn't, the new variant doesn't affect that, um, but uh, we will, I guess we will wait and see. And the Maulers, where's the Maulers going to play? <laughs> Do not believe that's been announced yet. Huh? I don't know if it's been announced yet. It's been announced. Well, maybe they'll play in the city. Hopefully, since it'll be hopefully Pittsburgh. Um, what's the <laughs> what's the other tax? What tax do we drop? Other taxes drop hundred percent. Oh, I can answer that one if you don't mind. Yeah. Go, Jen. <laughs> other taxes is so. In the past, we used to collect um, a mercantile tax, um, what they call an occupation tax. EIT used to be called PGH 40. 
And so um, they're all since gone away and they've been replaced with the business tax and um, self-assessed taxes that you see currently. And they're most of the ones outside of, you know, like real estate and deed transfer and Act 77. But um, so we see them sometimes in small increments. Maybe somebody pays a past due tax that was due a long time ago, or maybe they are um, in bankruptcy and we receive a payment for um, a bankruptcy uh, claim that we have out there for one of those taxes. And so that's an inconsistent number. Sometimes we see money in those years. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes somebody's owed a refund for whatever, which could be why it's negative. So Mm. they're just miscellaneous ones that are still hanging out there from years past. Okay. Um, I had a question and I'll turn it over to other members. This, uh, these items here, we have different retired, like uh, different public safety. And one is, you know, it seems small amount. So what's going on here? We put in, like say for a retired EMS 5,000, that's just, we just put an additional 5,000 in. So what, <clears throat> so what those are, those are uh, health insurance reimbursement payments okay, made healthy. to a certain subset of retirees in those public safety um, bureaus. Because um, obviously those employees were employed by the city uh, a, a while ago, um, and as they begin to fall off the, the health insurance, um, we, you know those payments will no longer be needed. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, and uh, I will thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just real quickly to follow up on Councilman Wilson's question about uh, property sales. Can you talk to us a little bit about the three taxing bodies trust fund? Because I see those numbers are, are drastically going down. Jen, would you like to address the three taxing bodies? Yes, I will. I'm sorry. I was having trouble hitting the mute button. <laughs> Apologies. Um, actually, that's something that's been happening uh, year over year as we've not sold as many properties and have a hard time disposing or uh, of properties. Um, what we did actually to kind of slow that down a little bit is some of those positions in three taxing bodies, if they're also doing um, work for just the real estate department, we actually split up their duties as to the percentage of which area they're working for. And we've been able to defer some of that cost then to the general fund. So, and I think we're hoping as if we're able to sell more properties and also with ones that transfer, hopefully to the land bank, that we would able to be able to actually save on property maintenance. So, which is an issue. Okay. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, well, actually, I apologize. I should have deferred to Councilwoman Strasburg. She had questions. Oh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and. Thank you to the, uh, the, the uh, everyone here from the Department of Finance. And I apologize for missing your presentation, but I do have all the information and, and relevant sections of the budget in front of me. I really don't have too much. Um, just a couple of clarifying questions for me to help my understanding. I see... Regional asset district here as a revenue source. Can you explain to me how what our relationship is with RAD and 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 how we how we both receive and then use RAD funding, RAD sources of funding? Yeah, so that 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 uh, line object account uh, title that you're referring to is is basically the portion of the sales tax that we get through the regional asset district. So um, the the RAD. The RAD dollars uh, that we get, we also use for uh, DPW operations uh, as well as parks operations and capital projects. This is just based on uh, sales tax that happens uh, in the region. Um, and that's why it's recorded into the general fund uh, in, in this revenue category. 
Okay. So unlike, and this is just my lack of knowledge for how RAD works, but it's not a grant from RAD, like other nonprofits or like the library would get. It's a, it's a, it's a portion of the sales tax. Yeah. This particular one is a portion of sales tax. We do get uh, the grants from RAD for both operations, uh, operating expenses and capital expenses um, that are housed within DPW and parks though. Um, and those are, those uh, costs are, or those revenues and expenses are in the trust funds. Sure. And that's specifically for certain um, properties, entities that are eligible, right? For it, Yeah. It's, it's the, the, the expenses are limited to the five regional, regional parks in our area. Okay. okay. And I was just, I just wanted to note, I'm glad to see a land care maintenance coordinator added. So, but aside from, aside from that, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Regarding the land care maintenance coordinator, does that also tie into the work of the three taxing bodies? Is that why it's in the Department of Finance? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Councilman Wilson. Thank you. I just had some follow-up questions. I just want to ask Jennifer how the one tax PGH is, is, is going. So the one tax PGH would be our online portal um, for taxpayers to pay or review all of their taxes, which is working, but it's been pushed back um, for release for a little bit. Uh, basically due the, to the pandemic, we've been trying to build out a comprehensive tax system all virtually. <laughs> so it's been a bit of a challenge and um, we have business, the business tax for our employees up and running. Um, but there are some issues that they have to work through. So considering that we're trying to work through those things and get them repaired first, um, we have delayed the, uh, the go live for the real estate portion of the tax system and then the online as well. But we hope to have that done in early 2022. Yeah. Are we going to be able to process the tax uh, payments in a, in a decent time this year? Yeah, it, we're hoping to, I mean, to be, to be honest, through this whole thing, we've had basically two people that have processed all those tax payments and, you know, we've lost people due to the pandemic. We've had people ill or had to quarantine, but through all this, two people basically have been responsible for depositing and processing all of those documents and payments. But next year we have uh, more staff that's on the budget that we intend to hire. And hopefully with the new tax system up and running, it will also help to speed that up. Okay, so to prevent those delays, apologize if I missed this, I walked in a couple minutes late. The These added positions is what the the thought is to, this was this was an action that you all took, that you're taking, that you want to have these added. Oh no, I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at what's, I was about to mention the titles, but then I'm actually looking at the ones that are being eliminated here. So which ones are you adding that will help you? Remittance, they're the remittance specialists. It's, it's being eliminated on my sheet. No, it's so Councilman Wilson, the, the, the way it's depicted uh, in the personnel sheet is kind of quirky because we had to amend the 2021 uh, document. So uh, any any position that we re-implement or yeah re-implemented with the amended 2021 document, we assigned a, a, a full one FTE. Uh, but if you look at the months uh, in the third column or in the column over, you'll see a lower number than 12, meaning uh, that that position was only reinstated for six or four months. Um, and that's tied to the amended budget. Whereas now in 2022, uh, we're accounting for all 12 months. So while it looks like it's being uh, reduced, uh, if you look one line above, you will see that that number goes from two in 2021 to, to 4.1. Uh, and that's because that's for those remittance technics, technician positions that are full time and are also splitting time uh, between processing things for three taxing bodies. OK. All right. Thanks for that clarification. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussions for finance? 
If not, we thank you for being here with us today. We'll move on to the Department of Law and I'll ask our budget director to give an overview. You're on mute. I mean, yeah. I hit it twice again. I'm sorry about that. Um, the mission of the Department of Law is to provide legal advice and services as in house corporate counsel to the city of Pittsburgh, which often involves providing advice to the mayor, city director, city council, and various government units. It represents the city in all legal aspects of its daily government functions. It also represents the city in high profile cases, significantly impacting public policy city residents' quality of life. Department of Law operates as a quality, proactive boutique law firm, attracting talented professionals with impeccable integrity from the public and private sectors. The Law Department also oversees and provides support for the Ethics Hearing Board. Uh, financials for the Department of Law this year, budgetary impact, total budget $6,283,000, an increase of $654,000 or 11%. Total full-time positions, 34.5, plus funding for uh, part-time positions. Salary and position changes of note in administrative assistant and claims administrator has been uh, eliminated and replaced with two paralegals, a net increase of $6,150. Four assistant solicitor positions receive modest increases. Total increase between all four is $12,700. Part-time legal secretary is eliminated $28,467. Uh, Department of Law non-salary subclasses changed across five line items for net increase of $461,000 or 20%. Uh, there were minor changes uh, to where line items are housed. The only two of note are judgments was increased by $311,000. $250,000 of the increases for Pima match to buy out landslide properties. Legal fees are increased by $150,000 for outside legal counsel for labor matters. A uh, law department has no capital projects and the law department also has no uh, trust funds. Uh, and I might as well just read the ethics uh, board as well too. Uh, total budget there, 175,000. $356, there's an increase of $5,200. No changes to any positions or non-salary line items. The increase is due to the non-union cost of the living raises uh, to existing positions and minor increases to the benefit line. And with that. With that, well, uh, Solicitor, do you, anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to thank council very much for considering our budget request. We appreciate your questions and uh, consideration. I'd like to thank the administration for working with us to develop a detailed budget to continue serving our clients. And I'd, I'd like to uh, thank the 33 very hardworking members current of the law department for helping serve our client, the city of Pittsburgh diligently every day and I especially appreciate everyone's flexibility during the pandemic to continue to get things done timely and effectively. And i um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from members? Councilwoman Strasburger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you to our solicitor for being here today, but most importantly for the work that you and your team do every single day. I know that um, you can always use more support. You can always use more staff. You can always use more bandwidth and you're serving the city of Pittsburgh, which means you're serving hundreds of different clients, every different, you know, thousands of clients every day, in a sense, um, you have many bosses and that pulls you in different directions and that's not an easy task. So I recognize that. And I guess outside of the budget, just looking at the, you know, the um, organizational chart for the department, do you, um, Do you think that the, that this is the best 
um, structure for the, the law department? Do you, is it working well? Is it, you know, is it, is everyone housed in kind of the appropriate um, office within the, um, the Department of Law? Are there other models that you've seen that might be ideas for us to consider? Uh, just wanted to kind of use this as an opportunity to discuss that and, and get your thoughts on that, on the, that issue. So thank you. I, I think that we have, um, we're a mighty team for the amount of work we perform for sure. I think we have a pretty good balance right now of what we handle in house and, and what is done with outside counsel. And, you know, I, I guess facility wise, we're kind of bursting in that we're, we're a pretty full house. I think in terms of the number of attorneys, um, we're, we're down a couple now in the labor group. So we're, we're hiring, we're, we're looking to hire. And I think once that complement is completed, we may, uh, there may be some recommendations about how that kind of team works, whether there should be maybe more of an oversight uh, with one more experienced attorney and other attorneys can come for questions and maybe have some newer attorneys, but it's, um, you know, going to be up to uh, the new solicitor to, to make that call. Um, you know, there are some other, uh, we've always found it important to kind of cross train people. So I do think it's important to the extent that uh, there's the time to do it. And it's important to make time to do it, to make sure that more than one person knows how to do different functions. So we have, for example, one main person doing right to know and one person handles uh, code enforcement. And I do think it's important to kind of maybe bring in some other attorneys to learn how to do that as well in a more proactive way. So we're not kind of reacting, but we're anticipating needs going forward. I'm not sure that answered your question exactly, but I think that's kind of where we are now. That's, that's helpful. You got at some of the issues I was curious about, so that's helpful. And given all of the, um, the hard work that your team does, but also the, the constraints, are we in a place right now where there can be some sort of anticipation or proactive education learning about, you know, um, policies you anticipate might be heading for Pittsburgh, that when we see policies sort of spread throughout the country, right, and they can, um, you know, just interest, political interest or whatever uh, might be the case, that, that there can then be the, the, the kind of um, anticipatory work done to, to prepare for, or learn about that. I know that some attorneys within the law department I talk to, they follow within their area of study, they, they follow the law very, very closely in a myriad of ways, um, you know, by reading cases, by just studying case law, by just staying on top of the, the issues of interest to them. So I know it happens on a, um, on a case by case basis, but is that, is that currently built into the, the department? Is it just, the, or is it not because we just don't have the bandwidth? I'm kind of curious there. So we have an attorney currently who kind of assists if we're invited or we learn about an amicus brief opportunity, for example, whether that might be, you know, it could involve a variety of issues, um, firearms or immigration. And if the administration or council members are interested in us, you know, looking into that, um, there is an attorney who does kind of assist with reviewing those briefs and we then, you know, work to decide if that's something that the city um, may want to join. Um, and there are other, you know, some other opportunities for us to be more proactive in the opioid litigation, for example. Um, we have out, we are working with outside counsel on that. So, uh, you know, I will say that the, the kind of general day-to-day -day work does keep us busy and we're only able to do a certain amount of the outside advocacy. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that there's an interest in 
expanding that probably would be helpful to have, you know, an attorney kind of focused on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for labeling it as outside advocacy, because I never want to I never want to call something advocacy inappropriately when we're talking about a law department. But that's that's kind of what I had in mind in that question. So I appreciate that. Um, you said it, so I wanted to acknowledge it because um, I, I didn't know if this was, was public, but you said a new solicitor. So I wanted to just take the opportunity right now to acknowledge that, um, you know, you will be leaving us. Right. And I just want to thank you for your decades you know, plus of support of, uh, of work for the city. Um, I know that you've seen a lot pass through the law department and you've, um, been at the helm now for, um, almost my entire time working for, you know, working at the city of Pittsburgh in some capacity or another. And, um, I really just want to thank you. I know it, it's, it hasn't always been easy and you have been, um, under a tremendous amount of pressure in a lot of different ways from many different people and you've handled it with grace. And I, I appreciate the work that you've done. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. It's been my honor to serve as a solicitor and it's been my honor to work in the law department for uh, many years and to work with, um, you know, I think it's five administrations now and um, such talented, talented people and um, working with you, councilwoman and other members of council has been interesting and, and challenging and uh, very fulfilling. And I appreciate that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Councilman Burgess. Um, so, Sir Hilton, as you know, I have the highest regard of, for you and for your insight and professionalism. Um, I, I always enjoy the interaction with the law department. I think, not sure, but I think my office has as least as much, if not more interaction with various people in the law department of anyone on council. I, I, I tend to- <laughs> You I, might be right. <laughs> <laughs> as you know, I, I tend to like to kind of go at stuff, right? You know, in my mind, I'm having this um, even, rereading the charter and, you know, second class city law and just, you know, anyway, that's the second sidebar. I just, I really have learned to appreciate you. Um, and um, even when we disagree, you have done it with kindness. When you corrected me, it's been with kindness and gentleness and, um, and, um, and great insight. And so I, um, I am saddened that you will, you have been a pillar of stability and strength in our city. Um, I think the law department may be the single most important department in city government because in many ways it decides the scope of work and the breadth of activity that the city can take on because of your rulings and your insight. Um, I have tried in the past to always be a from, from Spectre on. I've tried to be a friend of, of the solicitors because I, I take their role very seriously. I've never, I've never publicly um, um, challenged their, their, their opinions, nor do I intend to. And so um, I, on one thing, I am I am sad and very sad um, to see you go um, because you have just been that that tremendous, gifted, committed public servant. Um, and then, second of all, I will say very publicly that I will then um, even more so than the last time I had, I will be extraordinarily um, um, word. I will be. I will. I will be very vigilant on examining the qualifications of the next solicitor. I will demand that that person has municipal, a solid municipal background. I, I would not, I will not vote for a solicitor um, that comes from, you know, a, a federal 
or, or state perspective. I, I will not. Um, we are at such a pivotal point in the life of this city. I am completely, completely committed to the notion of local government expertise. And so one of my, and I'll say that, it doesn't matter who the mayor is, but it matters to me very much. What I mean by it, it doesn't matter which, it doesn't matter to me, I say it wrong, it doesn't matter to me what the person is that the mayor sends. What matters to me is the qualification. We need someone that has a proven track record of municipal experience at this time. That's my own personal belief. But I say it to say I'm, I'm really grateful for your leadership. And I'm a, you. you know I'm a fan. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilman Wilson. Yes, uh, I have to say I learned something new in this, this uh, hearing here. So sorry I wasn't privy to the info prior. But um, yes, thank you for your for your public service. And um, it's been uh, it's been a a good experience working with you and your department, especially on a couple bills that um, you know, I've been one I was working on for a while, and then the other one I just kind of put on the table and uh, your, you and your office have been very um, helpful in each, each regard. So just wanted to, although we've, we've had a brief, a brief period of working together. So I feel, uh, you know, it's unfortunate it's being cut short, but I wish you all the best in your, you. in your next, next endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? If not, I also just simply want to thank you for your years of, of work, Solicitor Hilton. Um, you have supported this council, even at times when we've disagreed. <laughs> um, you've helped us find a way to get a lot of things accomplished. Um, there are a lot of bills that this council has fought for that we believe were right and just. Um, and then you've helped us craft them. And then you've helped us go to court. I even think of a bill such as source of income which we ultimately lost, but that you went time and time again to try to defend because it was right and just. And even as I look at Councilwoman Strasburger, the work that she did around gun safety um, and the work that you all provided to support, to figure out a way for us to provide um, gun safety laws within our city. So you have, you have been a strong, fierce advocate on behalf of the city. Um, you're taking away with you decades of institutional knowledge that we will so surely miss. Um, but I want to congratulate you. Thank you for your years of service. And we wish you nothing but the best in your next endeavors. And given that you're not leaving too far um, from government, I'm sure we'll be working again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. If nothing else, um, I, need, I do need to announce that uh, council budget hearings will continue tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with Department of Public Works, which will be chaired by Councilman Coghill, with that, we need a, a motion to recess. Motion to recess. Do the ethics, anything on the ethics? Oh, questions? I apologize. <laughs> okay, thank you. He, I read the- uh, I, apologize. Time out. I apologize. He read ethics, and since no one asked a specific question, does anyone, any council member have a question? If, if oh, Councilman Coghill? I, no. Maybe she left because she figured it was. Yes, yeah, she's not. It's okay. I can hear that. Um, Leanne is with us. Oh, Leanne is with us? Yes. Oh, where you at, Leanne? I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I would also like to join um, everyone else here in uh, thanking Yvonne for her dedication to the city. Uh, it's been such a pleasure getting to know her and um, it, you know, receive her guidance and, um, she's, she's great. So, um, but as, as to ethics, are there any questions about that? We, we don't have any budget uh, requests this year, um, especially due to the, you know, the, the, such a, a shortened, um, amount of revenue coming in due to the pandemic. So I thought it was appropriate to try to just keep things the same for now. Um, any questions for, for me? Yes. This is Councilman Coghill? Yes. Uh, Leanne, this is Councilman Coghill. How are you? Hi. 
to see you. Hey, listen, I, I first want to compliment you. You know, when you took this office, before you took it, I felt it was like a bit of a mess. We would go to turn our expense reports in and the door was locked on the day that it was, you know, uh, due. Um, and I really appreciate you to making the effort to coordinate our expense reports to be with the counties, you know, um, at least the third one in each primary slash general election. Um, I know now, which was a lot easier and I do, you know, I could hire somebody to do all that, but Lisa and I are kind of fanatics about making sure everything is to the dime. And, you know, um, we scour over our reports 30 times um, before we turn them in. But I just want to ask you, so we, you require three reports in the three months leading up to primary or general election. That's correct, right? Yes. Okay. Why three reports? Then? I, you know, and I, I'm just speaking as a, you know, for anybody running for office, you know, things change. We write a check and then we have to do a whole new report for you in, in the next week or two. So, so why is it, why can't we just be on the same schedule as a county and just turn in the same paperwork we do with the county? Um, is it, what's the, you know, what's the yeah, thought? I, I believe the initial legislative intent here was uh, for there to be a greater um, transparency and accountability here. Um, the, as you know, the county report is due basically a week before the election. Um, so I think that the initial intent uh, when the legislation was passed in 2015 was to um, increase the, the amount of time before the election. Um, but I'm, I'm more than happy to revisit this with you and, um, uh, you know, maybe I could do a survey <laughs> uh, of different... Months yeah. came, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no, Leanne, it just seems like an extraordinary amount of paperwork that we have to do and deadlines that we have to meet. And we try to meet every one of our deadlines. And Lisa raves about you and what you're doing with the department. I'll, I'll have you know. So not oh, being you. of you in any way, shape or form. OK, and I know these procedures were in place before you came on, I believe. But I yeah, am there used to be five. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yes, there were five, and I'm glad we're down to three. And I'm glad the last one is just simply copying what we're putting to the county and giving to you. That just makes sense, you know. Those other two that are due, I don't know why the transparency, you know, you know, what we turn into the county is public knowledge, and I feel anybody could look at, and I'm not sure why it was implemented like that, but, you know, I, I just would think it's a lot less work for you and for the candidates and for everybody involved. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to try to hide in a month versus, you know, uh, two weeks or four weeks prior to my primary. And I understand transparency, but I guess I feel like all the transparency is filed with the county. And I like the fact that we have our own ethics department. But, uh, you know, I feel like there's more work involved with our own ethics department. And quite frankly, I know that nobody really likes these reports unless I... Now I do, I look at my opponent's reports all the time. And I think I brought it to your attention. Uh, you know, one report was like chicken scratch, you know, and I thought, what is this, right? So I think we called you and you were quick to, you know, look into it for us. And I appreciate that. But so we're turning these reports in, but nobody's looking at them unless you inquire to look at them, right? Somebody asks. So it's not like your department's going over and saying, well, wait a minute, this is not quite right. Right. Um, yeah, we do have um, the ability to audit the reports now. Um, and in terms of the interest in campaign finance, um, that's a that's a great point. I do think that there should be more public engagement. Um, so yeah, that's something that we can look at as well. Uh, different um, places in the country run things very differently in terms of uh, elections and campaign finance. Some places have. Uh, um, uh, monies for um, uh, the average citizen to to um, uh, to give that are public. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, places like New York and, and California, where um, residents can match um, uh, the amount that's given, um, which has led to greater um, civic engagement. Um, I don't think that's in our future. <laughs> Um, to have these matching funds, but um, there are different ways that we can do this. There was um, a really neat study where um, the amount of civic engagement around the um, election of a candidate 
um, is directly correlated to um, disbursement of city services thereafter. And they found when, um, you know, the more people that can be engaged, um, that cuts down on um, racial and income inequalities um, and, and helps distribute those public services um, more justly throughout the community. So I think it's important. Um, and, you know, just like you said, getting those uh, procedures, how many filings it should be, when should the reporting periods line up, I think that sort of technicality um, can be fine tuned over time. Yeah. To, it, to find it, a better fit. It's not just your department, the city controller. I talk to often about this as well. He has a separate date. So we have three different filing reports. Um, mm -hmm. You have, you require three before each one. We got one with the controller. We got one with the county, you know, before every primary or general election. So that there we're looking at five different reports that are due on all separate dates. You know what I mean? I feel like mm -hmm. at the time I'm like trying to figure out who's, whose date is due and, and, and it changes. So I, may have yours, you know, scheduled one day and then I write a check for something the next day and I got to do another one for Michael Lamb and his office, mm -hmm. you know. So I personally, you know, wish we could cut out the multiple reports and just do it, whether we want to do it earlier than the county would be more transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if this is a question for you or maybe this body, uh, you know, our campaign finance amounts, our limits, you know, we're limited to $2,800 per person, $5,000 per pack. You know that? Do you follow that? Uh, yeah, our limits are tied to the FEC limits. Um, I believe it's 2,900, but you're right. It's, <laughs> it's a low number for an individual. It's about 5,000 for a pack, I believe. Um, and that's tied to the election cycle. Um, so and you know, I'm probably better off talking to some members of council about how we can adjust that. I don't, I, I feel like we shouldn't have those limits when state offices and other people don't have the limits. And when you have people running for mayor's office, they just set up some special PAC fund that pays for everything. You know what I mean? So there are ways around it. I feel like we are the ones, the only ones in, in the Western Pennsylvania who are restricted by the amount we can raise. And don't get me wrong. I don't have hordes of people saying, Anthony, I want to give you more money, but I mean, <laughs> not even close, you know, but uh, you know, um, I just wish we didn't have to worry and think about it just like every other elected official. And it really limits, say, for instance, I don't have any other aspirations, but if one of these council members wanted to run for governor, you know, um, well, I guess they'd set up a different pack for that. So that's not fair. But um, OK, so so at the very least, I'd like to look at those limits at some point. And okay. I don't know if we'd have to do that legislatively. Does, does anybody here at the table now? Yeah. OK, so so I would like to. Uh, go ahead. Our, our limits and our reporting is all based upon the legislation that was passed. Got it. And that was what eight years ago or so. Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, at least for on your end, Lee, and I'll talk to council members about that and see if the will is there to actually change that in the young months. But um, but on your end, yeah, if we could try to, you know, rather than three reports in a three month period, we can do you know one report like everybody else. This way, I only have to worry about three rather than five reports every election cycle. I'm not worried about it for another four years, but I thought, you know, other members will be up soon <laughs> trying to do them a favor too. So um, I just, you know, if you're paying somebody to do it, I guess it's another story. You don't have to worry too much about it. But as I told you, we kind of take, I take it all on myself and I find it to be incredibly, you know, um, unnecessary, I would say more than anything, especially when nobody even looks at them. I don't feel, you know, and nobody audits them. You, you do have the power to audit, which is good to hear. I didn't realize that, but I did my own auditing, of course, with my opponents and some other people, and I found like multiple, multiple mistakes. And, you know, I don't know how we enforce that if we do find those mistakes. I think we just go back and they change it, right? And then they resubmit it, and we hope that's more accurate. But, uh, okay, that's all. I, by the way, Leanne, again, I want to thank you. You know, you are a breath of fresh air. I can't remember the former, you know, director's name, but, uh, you know, I know you work with Lisa a lot more than you do with me. But um, so I'm going by what she says mostly, and she just adores you and thinks you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. you. To see some of those changes along with me, though. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that, that's it for me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? If not, I um, also just want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, I know you personally 
have reminded me on numerous occasions that I needed to get my report in. Um, <laughs> I, I would lose track of those dates. So I, I appreciate that on behalf of my mother. She also appreciates the reminders that you provide us with and the clear instructions on how to get it done. So thank you. But I also agree with Councilman Cocker. You can make some changes. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. If not, if nothing else, um, hearings will continue tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with the Department of Public Works, um, chaired by Councilman Coghill. We need a motion to recess. Motion to recess. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. We're on recess.